Acts chapter 11. It's like, it's going to be like a sharp turn. Um, this month, I, I want to seek to focus us on the missional assignment and responsibility that we have in this house. As we look at the spirit of thanksgiving, I want us to kind of focus on the missional responsibility that we have. You've seen some of the videos today that we focused on our efforts in Ghana through our missional arm, and I, I want to kind of focus our time together today on the missional responsibility we have. Acts chapter 11, we'll commence our reading at verse number 19, and we will conclude it at verse number 30. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. When you have it, will you let me know with the sound of amen? amen. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. Some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas, to go as far as Antioch. We came, had seen the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all that with the promise of heart they should continue with the Lord. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarshish to seek Saul. When he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. In these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood and showed by the spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. I want to focus our time together on these next two verses, 29 and 30. Then the disciples, each according to his own ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say together, thanks be to God. The time that we'll share, I want to tag this text with this thought amazing things at Antioch <clears throat> amazing things at Antioch the book of Acts details the incredible origin story of the church just as Jesus foretold in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 they will receive the power of the Holy Spirit will first be witnesses for Jesus in Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. And just like Jesus said it was going to happen in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, you better know it happened. You know, the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came, filled these believers with power from on high. And once they received this power, Bible says that Peter stood up in the congregation of all those who had gathered outside that upper room and preached with such power and clarity that thousands came to faith in Jesus on that day. And the church at Jerusalem started that this group of people started to gather and grow. And as they gathered and grew, they saw miracles. Acts chapter 3 details the fact that one day they went to the temple to pray there was a man there who had been paralyzed but the moment Peter touched his hand he got strength in his legs got up running jumping and glorifying God but you should also know that while miracles were happening as the church was growing so was opposition because listen to me you buckle up this is an important truth I hope it brings you some sort of peace or comfort today if not comfort at least it will bring clarity you should know that anytime you start growing so will opposition. 
ain't, ain't no way to slice or to dice it. The moment you start to develop and become all that God has called you to become, start to do what God has called you to do. The bigger and better you get in your walk with the Lord, you can bet your bottom dollar that opposition from the enemy is going to grow the more you start going for God. You can just set your watch to it. It is not just an individual thing. You'll see it as an institutional thing. As the church starts to grow as a community of faith, the enemy unleashes assault within that community to minimize not just the individuals, but to minimize the institution. When God allows you to develop, the devil's not just coming after you. The enemy's coming after everything in community with you. <clears throat> and that's what happens over the first few chapters of Acts. The church grows in power and witness and work and the opposition grows until it reaches a crescendo at the end of Acts chapter 6. There in Acts chapter 6, the church has grown so much that they have to change their structure. They need more hands to the plow, and so they ordain the first group of deacons who are designed to help serve the needs of the people. And there was a man named Stephen who was elected a deacon. His job as a deacon in the church was to serve the needs of the people. But outside the church, he still had a job to proclaim the coming of Jesus Christ, to proclaim the messianic work of Jesus. So he served the tables in the community and walked out in the community to talk about Jesus. Come here, lean in close. I don't care what you do in the house. When you leave the house, you still got a responsibility. And that responsibility is to declare to a dying world that Jesus came. Jesus lived. Jesus died, Jesus rose, and Jesus is sure enough coming back. That's your job. I know, I know you think I ain't nobody, but when you leave this house, you got a responsibility to declare to the world the coming of the Lord Jesus. This reality got Stephen in a little bit of hot water because it's easy to declare the word when everybody who hears it agrees. That's why a lot of people only want to talk about Jesus in the church. It's easy to talk about Jesus in here because folk came in here based on their agreement in the same belief. Stephen was willing to talk about it in a place where folk didn't agree. Are you bold for Jesus on your job? <clears throat> or do you just, or are you quiet because you don't want to upset the status quo? Stephen was willing to do it in a place where he knew he wouldn't be accepted. And the Bible makes it clear that these people who hear Jesus' declaration or Stephen's declaration of Jesus get so upset in Acts chapter 6 and the end of Acts chapter 7 that they grab him after he preaches this sermon about Jesus in the marketplace. They grab him, drag him out the city, and stone him to death. This is the first time we see a martyr for the cause of Christ in the beginning stages of the church. Stephen is stoned to death. Acts chapter 8 says that there is a young man there named Saul who approves of this um, killing. He oversees this stoning. And Acts chapter 8 verses 1, 2, and 3 say because of this, this is important, that the church scattered that day. <clears throat> because this great persecution against the Christians broke out in Jerusalem, the church scattered. You should know that this Greek word scattered means something specific. There are two words in the Greek lexicon for scattered. One word is used when you're scattering ashes, something that is dead. <clears throat> the word listed in Acts chapter 8 is not the word used for scattering ashes. It's the word used for scattering seed. It, it's, it's the word used when you take something and scatter it because when it's scattered, once it's planted, it's going to grow. And this is what I came to tell somebody, only for the five people that's going to grab this word. The enemy is trying to scatter you to make you feel like you're dead, like you're done, like you've lost it. But you should know that it ain't, it ain't ashes, it's seed. <laughs> Lord have mercy. 
that, that this thing that feels like separation because of death is actually something that once it's planted in the right spaces is going to produce fruit that will remain. I just need somebody to grab this. Your life, your dreams, your visions ain't dead. They're just being planted in a place that will allow them to bear fruit in its season. This is what happens to the church. The enemy thought that by persecuting the church, the church would scatter like ashes, but in fact, they scattered like seed. They, they were spread all over the globe. This, this event, this stoning, pushed them all over the place. This event in Acts chapter 8 pushed them all over. But as we approach our passage in Acts chapter 11, Acts 11 details the fact that a few hundred miles north of Jerusalem, 300 miles specifically north of Jerusalem, in one of the most important cities in the Greco-Roman world, considered to be the hub of business for the empire, something amazing was happening. Y'all know Rome was the seat of power, Alexandria was the seat of scholarship, but this city, 20 miles from the Mediterranean Sea, 300 miles north of Jerusalem, was the seat of the Roman Empire in commerce and culture. The city was called Antioch. Antioch was once known for its trade and its carnality. But the problem was, as Acts chapter 11 opens for them, their city is being infiltrated. <clears throat> it's being infiltrated by these people belonging to what's known as the way, who are seeking to avoid persecution from the religious leaders in Jerusalem because the religious leaders in Jerusalem who killed Stephen had decided to weaponize their orthodoxy to the point of being willing to kill these believers in Jesus because these believers in Jesus decided to stray from the patriarchal, self-righteous, self-serving, manipulative religious practices of the Pharisees. So in this great scattering that took place in Acts 8, some believers sought refuge in Antioch, and by Acts 11, we're seeing some amazing things take place at Antioch. Is your Bible open? The text will show you that at Antioch in Acts chapter number 11, something crazy was happening. The gospel was initially just going to the Jews, just going to people of a certain background and heritage until it reached Antioch. Then when it gets to Antioch, there, there was this diversity in who received the gospel. They stopped holding the gospel to people who are of a certain orthodox uh, background, but everybody started to get the gospel. Do, do you see it? At Antioch, there was a diversity in the gospel experience. Everybody didn't look the same anymore. This is amazing. Everybody didn't think the same. Everybody didn't come from the same background. Everybody didn't come from the same heritage. Everybody didn't come from the same generation. Everybody didn't come from being taught the same things. There was some diversity in Antioch. Amazing things. What happened in Antioch? The Bible says that the hand of the Lord was upon them and it was evidenced in the fact that people believed amazing things are happening at Antioch that God's presence was so profound at Antioch that people were coming to faith in Jesus. Amazing things were happening. So much so that the word of the amazing things happening in Antioch got back to Jerusalem. That the word traveled some 300 miles without cell phones and social media to declare that amazing stuff was taking place at Antioch of all places. In this bustling metropolis, people were receiving Jesus. And the world was hearing about it. Because amazing things were happening at Antioch. Did y'all see who ends up at Antioch? The same Saul from Acts 8 who approved of the killing of Stephen that sent people to Antioch in the first place is now at Antioch with the Christians whom they've been given this name because they found identity at Antioch. Saul is now coming to church being discipled at Antioch. 
Now you should know, you should know that, that Saul is converted in Acts chapter 9 and from the moment he's converted, he's rejected every place he goes until he finds a home at Antioch. Um, amazing things are happening at Antioch when people who got a past can be discipled in a new place and treated like family at Antioch. The Bible open, the Bible says that Antioch becomes a place of spiritual activity. So much so that prophets show up to declare the word of God because it is a house that is so sensitive to the presence and the word of God that supernatural stuff takes place at Antioch. That the Lord can speak in unique ways and release his presence in tangible ways. So much so that prophets are coming from all over because they know that that's a space where the prophetic oil runs. Amazing things are happening at Antioch. Spiritual momentum is taking place at Antioch in Acts chapter 11. But for all the amazing things that are happening to and for the believers at Antioch, the true test of their spiritual maturity and development will be found in their response to the prophet listed in our text named Agabus and his word from the Lord. This word, buckle up, was not about their experience. This prophet didn't tell them a house was coming or a car was coming or the job was coming or Boaz was coming. This prophet said trouble is brewing. Trouble is brewing in the world and this trouble is going to cause a need. A famine is coming. The writer points out that this word of prophecy was affirmed and took place during the reign of Claudius Caesar. The famine happened. During his reign, history teaches us that a series of bad political decisions led to years of bad harvests, and those bad harvests created famine throughout the world. Let me say it again. Bad political decisions created years of bad harvests. And years of bad harvests created famine throughout the world. No. One more time for the Holy Ghost. Years of bad political decisions created years of bad harvest. Y'all know bad harvest only comes from either bad cheap seed being sown, cutting financial quarters, quarters so that the rich can get richer and the poor get whatever they get, or planting good seed in bad soil. Bad political decisions lead to years of bad harvest. Years of bad harvest lead to years of hungry people. Y'all gonna catch that in the spirit later. The church at Antioch was made aware of this coming reality and, and though they knew it would impact them because they were a part of the world, they also recognized that in their thriving metropolis, it would impact some other people in harder, worse ways. And they decided to do something about it, even though they were going to have famine too. Friends, just like amazing things were happening in the church of Antioch in Acts 11, I, I need to report that some amazing things are happening in this house. Have you, have you paid attention or maybe you don't know or hear the stories, but, but, but there, there is some diversity in this house. The gospel has gone to reach all generations and people of different socioeconomic backgrounds from different sides of the track. And we even getting a little sprinkle of racial diversity. Shout amen. amen. There, there is diversity happening in this house. The hand of the Lord is on this house and it's evidenced in the fact that people are coming to Jesus for the first time in droves and people who swore off the church and said they would never come back to the church have not only come back to the church but planted their feet in our church and are serving faithfully in our church because amazing things I've been blessed to go all over the place 
through National Baptist Convention and through school and through preaching opportunities and assignments. And every time I get anywhere I get, people from miles around are asking me, how in the world are y'all producing that kind of fruit at Antioch? Because amazing things are happening. And just like word traveled 300 miles back to Jerusalem, the length and breadth of this nation are asking what's going on. Here it is. Here's another correlation. It's some Saul's in here. It's some people with some pasts in here. It's some people who sold more drugs and produced more money from the drug game than you've ever produced in your job. And the Lord has radically saved them and changed them and brought them to Antioch. It's some people who did long bids in prison who the Lord saved and redeemed and are showing up to serve and preach and spread the gospel and mentor the youth at Antioch. There are some people who the world counted out and said they can't make it nowhere that have shown up to be discipled and found community at Antioch and for five seconds I just need the souls to make some noise folk who, who, who have been told they would never amount to anything and God couldn't do nothing with them and that they were done when they were locked up that they were done when they were strung out that they were done when they were in the streets and look at you on a Sunday morning in the house of the Lord because Antioch is a place where you can find community and be discipled because amazing things are happening here there's high spiritual activity here y'all know it because y'all are trying to figure out how you come to church and, and and wonder how the message from this sacred desk sounds like it was written while reading your text messages you've been you've been connected and you've seen God open up doors and windows that blow your mind because we got members on commercials and in print and moving in ways you would never see because God is doing amazing things right here high level spiritual activity every time you come in here you feel the presence of God because amazing things are happening but in the same way Agabus made a declaration to the early church in Acts 11. I got to make an announcement today. And the announcement I got to make today is that while amazing things are happening in here, there's a famine in the land. Yes, it is. With food insecurity impacting the very community we sit in. There's a famine in the land with financial inequality causing people to feel the weight of inflation for everything but plateauing and declining income. There's a famine in the land with the state government intentionally trying to defund the public school system. The only place, may I add, where people who look like me can afford to go to school. There's a famine in the land with the concerted effort to continue warfare on black and brown bodies systemically with disproportionate morality rates for black women in childbirth there is a famine the famine in the land and, and while all these things are currently impacting us this famine has impact in places far beyond our own backyard. You heard Mariah talking about Ghana in the video, and it was a beautiful experience, but can I tell you, I saw poverty unlike anything I had ever seen in Ghana. And after I did my research, I figured out why. Because these same yet to be United States of America that has systemically oppressed her own citizens for centuries, have also robbed Africa of her greatest resources since this nation was established. America 
and those other European world powers showed up on the shores of Africa in the 13 and 1400s and robbed Africa of her gold and land. And after they took the gold and the land, they took her people through the transatlantic slave trade. And then after they took her people, they took her dignity and how she was portrayed. And then after they took her dignity, they took her political authority by vilifying, criminalizing, and in many cases, assassinating their leaders. And now... The beautiful shores of the places where many of our ancestors were stolen from still deal with unbelievable poverty because there's a famine in the land. It's far reaching. It's impacted the world. And while I know that we have our own issues to fight here, and I'm not minimizing them, I'm not ignoring them, I think there's something we can learn from the early church at Antioch in Acts chapter 11 that we should use to shape us today. It seems like the early church understood that the greatest evidence of the amazing work taking place in them was high levels of generosity that would help them positively impact the world around them. It's as though they believed that the best way to steward the momentum of how God was moving among them was to give generously so that the amazing things they were experiencing in their own city could bear fruit in the lives of people they never met while still impacting the place God planted their feet. Buckle up. I contend that the greatest problem with the current state of the world and quite frankly the church is that we seek out beneficial experiences for ourselves. And as long as we get what we need, we good. We got our word. We heard our song. We saw our friends. We got our blessing and our miracle. So we good. But when it comes time to display the evidence of the amazing things you've experienced with awareness of the world around you and generosity to that world, all of a sudden, you apathetic, you're detached, you're aloof. That stuff don't matter because you fat and happy off the word. But the truth of this text is that after we've experienced the amazing things at Antioch, we have a responsibility to display a level of generosity that allows us to do amazing things from Antioch. The evidence of the amazing work happening in the people, listen to me, is how quickly they respond to a need. This text is proof that when amazing things have been happening for you in God's presence, it will produce you, or it will produce some generosity in you. Look at what the amazing things happening at Antioch produce in the people from Antioch. One, According to verse, the last two verses, verse 29 and 30, this amazing move of God they were experiencing produced a people of determination. Is your Bible open? Look at verse number 29. Verse number 29 says that these disciples, each according to their own ability, were what? Determined to send relief. Everybody was determined to be generous. It's going to be quiet in here today. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. It's all right. You can't say amen, say out, say something so I know I'm not putting you to sleep. All right? The text says that the disciples were determined to be generous. Now, now you, should, you should know for the sake of painting with a broad stroke who disciples is referring to in this passage. Because when we hear disciples, we typically think the 12 that walked with the Lord. In the upper room, there were 11. They elected a 12th. Those 12 were there present and leading the church in Jerusalem. And when the great persecution broke out in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 8 tells us that everybody was scattered, but the apostles, the apostles, the 12, posted up in Jerusalem, and that became the seat 
of the early church. That became the place where the apostles were. So when the text says there are disciples at Antioch, it ain't talking about the 12 leaders. It's not talking about the upper echelon. It ain't talking about just a few. In this text, the word disciples refers to everybody who followed Jesus. Everybody who professed Jesus at Antioch is called a disciple. Everybody who professes Jesus is called to take up their cross and follow him. You are called to be a disciple. And the text would suggest that the greatest evidence of discipleship is generosity. Are you determined? to be generous or are you determined to be stingy? Lean in friends, both things can exist in the same space. It's hard to follow Jesus and be stingy. You cannot follow a God who so loved the world that he gave and reflect that God by keeping everything you got. All the disciples, watch this, everybody was determined to give, to be generous. Here it is, second clause of verse 29. They were determined to give each according to his own ability. Do you see that in your scripture? And I know what that did for some of y'all. Some of y'all just breathe a sigh of relief because that line right there convinced you that God knows you ain't got it, so you don't got to give it. Lord, you know I'm struggling. No, you didn't read that right. Let's try it again. Each according to his own ability, suggesting that everybody got the ability to do it, even if it ain't as much as you wish you could. Even if it ain't as much as the person next to you, everybody has the ability to generously help meet the need. Everybody. We, we learn this, not just from this passage in Acts, but from what Jesus said in the parable of the sowers. Have you, have you, have you read? There's a parable of the talents, rather. Have you read this? Where the Bible says that the master gives to three of his servants each according to their own measure of ability to be able to handle it. One servant gets a little bit because the master knew this servant and knew that he could only handle a little bit. Let me pause here parenthetically to suggest that maybe the reason you don't have more than you have is because God knows you can't handle it. I know we don't like this kind of talk, but you don't tithe now. Why would God give you more? I knew, I know, I know, I know. God is often gracious in not giving you what you want because God knows you would mishandle it anyway. You ain't ready for what you're praying for. God gives it based on the measure you can handle. And no matter what measure you can handle, you have a responsibility to generosity. I'm just in the text. Each according to his own ability was determined to send out relief. Friends, the amazing things happening in our midst should create generosity in us. And we should be determined to be generous. I got to move quickly. But after, after it develops a people of gener determination, it, it's going to develop a people of discipline. All right, hear me out. Not discipline in the way you think. Where, friends, does the text say the famine was going to be? The whole world. Is your Bible open? The famine was going to hit the world. Where did the church at Antioch send resources? Judea. They were disciplined enough Woo to realize that every need wasn't their need to meet. Come real close to me. They knew that though the world was going to suffer, the Lord put Judea on their hearts, so that's where they were going to give. Come here. Maybe you're so empty, tired, broke, 
drained and depressed because you've been trying to be everything for everybody. And the Lord never called you to be everything to everybody. The Lord told you to take care of Judea and you trying to save the world. Oh, I'm finna mess with some of y'all Christology in a minute. You, you thought it was your job to say yes to everybody who asked you, but everything that's good work ain't God work. And you tired because you're trying to meet needs that God never assigned for you to meet. And you're drained because you're trying to be a blessing to people that God never assigned to you. Yeah. Pastor Sam, watch this. This is going to mess up your Christology. You ready? My professor, Dr. Stephen Blunt, at the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University, shout out STVU, said to me Tuesday morning, around about 9.15 a.m., that Jesus did not come to be a need meter. Here's how he argues it, Pastor Sam. He had the audacity to tell me that any time Jesus performed a miracle, we miss the fact that there are thousands of other people still in need of a miracle. When he heals the man at the pool of Bethesda, there are thousands of other people still in need of a healing. When he fed 5,000, there were still 20,000 that needed to be fed back in the village. The only need Jesus came to meet was the one he met at Calvary. Everything else was extra. And if Jesus had sense enough to know, he didn't have time to save the world by feeding everybody, putting gas in everybody's car, paying everybody bills, paying everybody rent, paying everybody mortgage. What makes you think? It's your job to meet everybody's needs. If Jesus didn't feel the need to spend all his time taking care of everybody's stuff, what makes you think it's your job to waste your life and miss your ministry doing stuff God never assigned for you to do? Well, that's my cousin. They need it, and if, and if I don't give it to them, they're going to be stuck. What would they do if you ain't here? If God didn't assign them to you, stop making it your responsibility because it is stopping your ability to do the ministry that God assigned to you. And the church at Antioch was disciplined enough to know that their call was to Judea and not to Asia Minor. Stop pouring your resources in places God never sent you. Because when you do that, watch this. You are stopping the ability from somebody else to do what God called them to do. We ain't taking no missions trips to Europe because we've been called to Ghana. Hello. And if the church would be the church, they stop expecting us to go everywhere. And while I'm here, <laughs> y'all stop praying to send Jesus to places you can go yourself. While I'm here, stop praying and asking the Lord to visit a nursing home that's around the corner from your house. Lord, go down to the hospital, Lord. No, you go down to the hospital. Preach, Pastor Chris. I said what I said. And I add more to it. We have to be disciplined enough to know what God's called us to do. They knew the famine was in the world. They went to Judea. I'm done. There are people of determination, people of discipline. 
and a people of deployment. Woo, let the church say deployment. The text says that everybody, all the disciples, everybody, all the disciples were generous. They all gave, but everybody didn't go. Everybody gave. Everybody had a heart for generosity. Everybody didn't go. Everybody ain't going to go. All right? I do, I do want to make a couple of notes, though, of who it is that did go. The text says two people go. They, they, they raise the funds. They give the funds to Barnabas and Saul, who take the funds to the elders in Judea. Barnabas and Saul got to go couple things that we know about them according to the text that we read. Number one, we get a biography of Barnabas. It's brief, but it's powerful. Verse number 24 gives us a biography of Barnabas. This is why y'all keep your Bibles open because it's all right here. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Spirit, Full of faith. Everybody don't get to go because everybody don't got the right traits. You can't go because you're messy. You can't go because you're not trustworthy. You can't grow, go because you are not full of grace and patience and compassion. You can't go because you're easily irritated. You're giving over to fights. We can't trust you to go across the street and take some water. So why would somebody trust you to be deployed into? Full of the Holy Ghost. He's full of the Spirit. Ain't full of himself. Full of the Spirit. A good man full of the spirit, and of faith. Because deployment requires faith, because what you don't know is when you get there, you'll see some stuff that'll make you question some stuff. I'll be full of faith. Not only does Barnabas get to go, watch this. Ooh, y'all finna be mad at me. I don't care. Saul gets to go. Saul? Of all people? Saul got to go. But note that the text says something interesting has been happening in Saul's life. Is your Bible open? For the last year, Saul's shown up to be discipled. And because he had been discipled for a year, he was ready to be deployed. Buckle up. You, you, you can't go You, you, you're not ready for ministry deployment if you can't be faithful to be discipled and sit down for a season to grow. It's going to get tight right through here. But I can't, I can't get you to show up to a year's worth of rehearsals, but you want to be on the praise team. You won't show up to a year's worth of Bible study but we're on a platform to teach. You won't show up to church for 52 consecutive Sundays, but want a ministry leadership position. You left your last church because they wouldn't make you the lead in six months. And you call the responsibility of being discipled, church hurt. They're not mistreating you. They're trying to disciple you. Because until you've been discipled, you ain't ready to be deployed. Somebody should have said amen or something. Everybody can't go. 
And maybe the problem is we desire deployment more than we desire, desire development and discipleship. The purpose of the local church is to grow you up before you're sent out. Pastor Buckner, I might get myself in some trouble here, but here we go. That's why I am so concerned with the amount of churches popping up. Everybody got a social media ministry. Everybody's starting their own work and ain't submitted to nobody. It's scary that gospel artists are singing all over the world with no covering. And then they'll go start their own church, but don't have a pastor. How you going to lead people and ain't never sat under nobody? I'm going to help y'all. I'm going to help y'all. Here's Jesus, the word made flesh about his father's business. Y'all know Jesus said, I got to be about my father's business. Do y'all remember that? And what did Jesus do after he said, I got to be about my father's business? Anybody want to? He didn't go start preaching again. He went home to submit to his parents. Jesus disappeared for 18 years because even Jesus understood that submission is necessary before ministry. Jesus submitted to earthly parents that he had more authority spiritually over and yet he submitted when his mother said "There's we are out of wine do something and he said she said whatever he said do because Mary knew Jesus would obey Jesus would submit to leadership but church folk won't All right, I'm done. I'm on y'all nerves. The text says that they were people who understand deployment. Everybody gave, not everybody went. Here's another reason why everybody couldn't go. If everybody went, who was taking care of the house? There was still work to do in Antioch, though there was a need in Judea. And they understood that there was a responsibility to steward the presence of God in the place where their feet were planted and not be so focused on platforms in other places. There's work for you to do where your feet are planted. Stop looking for somewhere else to do it when God has planted your feet and given you assignment and ability to do it right where you are. Ooh, pastor, goodness gracious. How you going to shout us off this one? I'm not. <laughs> this is it. Here's the, end of the, here's the end of the sermon. You ready? Here it is. Here it is. Amazing things are happening here. It should be evidenced in our generosity. Lord, make us a generous church. Come on, officers. Come on, decision team members. Music ministry is about to share. I told Vernon I was going to be on my best behavior. He didn't believe it. If you're not walking this way, I'm going to ask that nobody's walking. We're not moving this way. We're going to ask that nobody's moving. We're going to get out of here together after we partake of the Lord's Supper. I want to um, extend an invitation to you to receive the most generous gift anybody could ever offer that should spur us into generosity. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever will believe in him should not perish have everlasting life. If you're here or you're streaming and you have not placed your faith, your hope, or trust in the Lord Jesus, it's as simple as saying, as Paul said, if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If you're in the building, there's somebody ready to safely talk to you about a decision for Jesus. If you're streaming, type in the comments, I want to be saved, or email us at membership at afnbc.org. Somebody will respond to you with how you can accept this generous gift of God. The wages of sin is indeed death, but the gift, this generous free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can receive that gift today. 
you're here and you know that you're not meant to do this on your own, that there is a place that the, you feel like the Lord is calling you to be a part of this local assembly of believers, to be discipled, developed, and ultimately deployed into your life's purpose and work. We would be honored to be the place where you grow. I'd be honored to be your pastor. If you're streaming online, say, I want to join this church or email us at membership at afmbc.org. Here in the room, you can step out from where you are, sit your team member, talk to you about that. Or if you just say, I need prayer. Something's going on in my heart. I need to be more generous. There's something that the Lord is doing, and I need somebody to agree with me in prayer. I want to invite you to uh, email us at prayer at afmbc.org. Type in those comments. I need prayer. Type in your prayer request. We'll agree with you. If you're here, you can step out from where you are. Somebody will pray with you. Our prayer ministry is ready to pray with you. So as the music ministry shares, if you want to receive the Lord Jesus today, if you want to be a part of this local assembly, local expression of God's love, or you need somebody to pray with you, we want to invite you to respond now.